Welcome to the Hero Maker Podcast. I'm Andrea Shreeman, writer, director, EP, living in LA. I'm Jennifer Morrison, and I currently serve as the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Vermont. We are here to seek out and tell the full story of our friends who were murdered in college, Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton III. We really need to make sure that their deaths were not in vain and that every possible lesson and improvement for the system can be squeezed from the retelling of the circumstances that ultimately led to the identification of their killer. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Nice to see you, Commissioner. Please, just call me Chen. It's kind of like we're friends. <laughs> what I'm excited about for today's episode is that we followed a lead. We had an amazing conversation, as our audience knows, with Tom Jackman, the Washington Post reporter who covered our friend's case from 2000 to 2015. And he mentioned the Pointer Institute, and he mentioned this ethicist, Kelly McBride, who is out there educating reporters and media outlets on how to positively impact society through ethics and journalism. And we reached out to her. And today we're going to introduce our audience to Kelly. Uh, When you told me about this as an interview, I obviously immediately jumped on their website and I got a little bit of the same energy from reading their website that I did when we interviewed Jared Side from the Center for Counsel. Like I identified immediately with their website content, particularly this course that they're offering right now, where they work with a cross-sectional team of people from a particular news outlet and take them through a multi-month long course to discuss how they cover crime and the impacts that can have on the community and on public health. And when I saw that, that that's some of the work they're in, and they're also working on trust and ethics in the business, I was like, this this is such fertile ground because there's a lot of ways that we can all be doing better, whether it's the police be doing better with the way we communicate with the media, But there's also certainly a lot of room for the media to rethink how they shape these stories and what they're reporting and how that either positively or negatively impacts people's perception of their community. Yeah. And whether or not it's actually fulfilling their intention as a media organization. Yeah. I just got to say, I was so excited for this. Yeah. And it was a great conversation. And the most exciting thing for me is that I was witnessing transformation in real time. In this conversation, there are nuggets of wisdom that were being birthed inside the conversation. I'm really excited for what can happen uh, through follow-up as a result in creating that relationship between public health, the people who are reporting events and public health, and law enforcement. It just really feels like bringing those three stakeholders together and setting out to do something that benefits the public and fulfills everybody's goals and intentions can be very, very powerful. Oh, I agree. And, you know, walking away from this interview, I have a lot of thoughts about how we can take the work we're already doing with our partners in public health and social services. And perhaps as that work and those relationships mature, contemplate bringing in that third party, the media And of course, as we talked about today and what I've known through my career is that it's all about the relationships. And if you don't have trust with a news outlet or with an an individual reporter, you're going to stick to the written script. You're not going to give them any context for the story or help them pull a thread that might be a more impactful, more positive, or more um, fair story in the long run that serves the public good more than sensationalizing individual crime events, right? Yeah. I thought today was exciting and definitely leaves me with food for thought. Awesome. Well, this is Kelly McBride, Senior Vice President of the Pointer Institute and also the chair of the Craig Newmark Center for Ethics and Leadership. Here we go. A journalism ethicist Is there anybody else out there doing what you do? There's a couple of college professors who do it mostly in the academic setting, but there's 
nobody like full time working on it in the professional setting. Now there are standards editors, which are very close to what I do. The difference is, is that standards editors are working for one organization and they're mostly in the weeds, right? Like how do we cover X or what do we say about Y? I'm looking a lot at the systems and how the systems of journalism break down because of various destabilizing forces that change the outcomes in journalism and thus democracy. And so, yeah, I, I look at it from a different perspective. So much more broad than their right. But also specific to, I didn't know that part about the destabilizing forces. So that's very interesting. Jen. I just want to know all about the Pointer Institute, but thought maybe we'd start with you. Like, tell us about your journey and how you got interested in this field. And then we can dive into what the Pointer Institute does. Yeah. I started my career as a journalist. I still consider myself to be a working journalist. I worked in newspapers for 15 years, spent most of my time covering crime as a newspaper reporter, spent the rest of my time covering religion, got a master's degree in theology. And I went to a Catholic university. And so you're very much studying the Catholic church and how they've come up with their theological understandings of things. And so that training in the moral systems of the Catholic church was sort of a primer for thinking about systems everywhere, right? Once you can analyze one system, you can analyze all the systems. And so started taking what I was learning about the Catholic Church and applying it to journalism. And then I had this one moment where, as a religion reporter, I was working for a newspaper in Spokane, Washington, and we had run a story that was just about the president of Gonzaga University publishing a new book. But he was a very controversial, divisive figure. And the copy editor who worked on that story had been a student and had had run-ins with him at Gonzaga University. And so she put a what was meant to be a bunk headline or a headline that wouldn't publish. And the headline said, Nazi priest signs his books. And it went into the paper. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. It was really bad. So I had to be the one to like write the story the next day about what a horrible thing that was and how the paper was very, very sorry and how it happened, how this copy editor was going to be fired and how... The other two people who should have caught it and weren't doing their jobs that night were going to be disciplined. And I called this guy who was like the journalism ethicist at the Pointer Institute for an interview. And he and I just hit it off on the phone. And we were just talking about cultural systems in newsrooms and how they contribute to bad decisions. And so we were talking about like the need to be clever and funny in newsrooms and how much journalists are rewarded by their peers for making off-color shocking jokes. And as a result of that conversation, he actually invited me to come down to Pointer and join a group of people who were just talking about how journalism ethics were evolving. And that ended up being a pivot point in my career because after that, I started doing a lot of contract work for Pointer and then eventually was hired to come down here. And so started working on something that I never imagined I would be working on. Or in a place. Yeah. I can't think of like a more polar opposite place in the country. Right. Geographically, you're in Spokane and now you're down in Florida. Yeah, culturally, it was huge. It was a big move. I moved my whole family, three little kids a dog and a guinea pig and a whole household. It was dramatic. You said something that really caught my attention in my career in law enforcement culture. We talk about it all the time. The culture of policing is often criticized like loudly, robustly by people who've never been involved in policing, by people who have been involved in policing. And it's a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. I've never actually heard anyone talk about the culture in a newsroom and how that shapes stories, headlines, and therefore democracy, you know, readers' opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about 
what the strong parts of culture are, the broken parts of culture in a newsroom and how you've seen it change over your career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons it's harder to talk about the culture of journalism than it is to talk about the culture of policing is the culture of journalism is more diffuse, right? We are an unlicensed, unregulated profession for the most part. So culture tends to be held. It's true with policing, right? Culture is held in each department. But there's more of a through line from department to department in policing than there is in journalism from organization to organization. But culture is held in the organization. And most journalism organizations, the driving forces that create their culture are two, three, four things. So one is the business model. How does this enterprise sustain itself? And the business model has changed dramatically for commercial media in particular, and that has changed the culture. But even when the business model was healthy, that drove the culture in a way that wasn't always the best for the public good, because you made decisions based on what would keep the advertisers happy. So you created this homogenous, very vanilla package that would appeal to a broad number of people in order to attract that broad number of people so that the advertisers would invest in you. And then as advertising declined or became less stable, the way it affected culture is suddenly news organizations had very few resources, right? And they were getting smaller and smaller. Or for national news organizations, they were competing for ad dollars in a very different way, primarily through sensationalism on the internet, that drove the culture. Now you see most healthy news organizations trying to develop either a subscription base or a donor base because the advertising market has fallen apart almost completely. And that is a healthier influence on culture because it tends to coalesce more uniformly with the public good. But when you look at broadcast, very different, right? Like they still are very ad dependent, looking at a declining audience, competing more and more with very high production needs. And so that tends to influence culture. The other thing that influences culture in journalism is the system of awarding journalism prizes. So a woman who works at the Marshall Project, who's really a sociologist, observed to me, she said, I don't know what really influences journalists, but I can tell you one thing, they are heavily influenced by their peers. And that rang so true to me, right? Like as a journalist, we care much more about what our peers think than we do about what the public thinks sometimes. So that influences culture. And you tend to be a little performative for your peers. And then beyond that, your relationship to the audience influences your culture. And that should be a good influence on your culture. But many newsrooms are only now developing the skills and the tools that they need to have a real relationship with their audience. So the relationship with their audience before they have these tools and skills is more about an assumption about what the audience wants, or even an antagonistic relationship with the audience, because the only people you hear from, Mm -hmm. if you don't have skills and tools, are the people who are complaining about what you're doing. So you get a little cynical. I was counting. That seems like three. You said there were four, right? That's at least three. Okay. Well, I, (laughs) I would say, I mean... In addition to that, the other thing that influences culture is this idealistic mission that many journalists have. Now, there is oftentimes a cognitive gap between how journalists identify that mission and then how they would analyze the impact of their work, right? Because most journalists who would embrace that mission would have to do a little bit of cognitive reasoning to say, okay, the work that I do really does fulfill this mission. Some of that's just practical. The mission's really idealistic. Some of it's a measurement problem. It's very hard to measure impact in mission, but some of it is just a gap between what we say we want to do and what we actually do. When you talk about news organizations that sustain themselves through contributions or subscriptions, doesn't that tend to aggregate people into niches? Like they're going to support the type or the genre of journalism that 
aligns with their worldview? On a national level, but on a local level, no. So it's probably much more complex than what I'm about to sort of put out there for your feedback. But when I was a kid, and this is a true story, when we would all watch the seven o'clock news together, and when Walter Cronkite said, and that's the way it is, by the time he was done signing off, your foot better be on the first step to get up and brush your teeth, <laughs> et cetera. Because that was, that was like the go signal for bedtime in our household. But what I recall from that era was that they reported, they did not editorialize and tell you how to feel about a situation or make assumptions about the underlying motives of actors in the scene that they were reporting. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Am I perceiving something too naively or too simplistically? I felt like it was objectively reporting back then. And what we see now for a large, large part, in fact, the vast majority is not objective reporting. There is an agenda. So I do think that you're being a little overly simplistic. What you're missing are all of the shortcomings from Walter Cronkite saying that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. Um, And those shortcomings include the fact that the majority of the country was not represented. Their needs and interests and viewpoints were not represented in that news report, right? Women, for instance, their viewpoints were secondary, very rarely represented. I mean, it used to be that you had to have an East Coast accent to be on television. Like you couldn't even be from Kansas and be on television, right? So if you think about the narrowness of the beginnings of broadcast television to what you see represented today, I think we're much better now. The idea that it was reported then and it is interpreted now is also, I think, a little overly simplistic because A lot of what was happening was interpretation, but because it was done from a point of authority for an audience of authoritative people who were valued, anybody who would argue with that interpretation was just dismissed, right? Yep. It was the power structure interpreting for the power structure. So that analysis is not necessarily accurate, but... What you see with the invention of the internet in particular, but not just the internet, cable news also, is you see a couple of things on the national level. And it's very, very important to separate out audience models because those influence how news organizations work. Let's start with cable news, right? With cable news, you see a rise in low production quality. You've got 24 hours to fill. You can't go out and report and produce a package for 24 hours of news, right? You're going to have a lot of time that you're just on the air talking. And so you're going to get a lot more loose interpretations, opinions, analysis, and frankly, more inaccuracies, right? You're just going to get all of that because it's happening live. It's not produced. So that's cable television. And then you see on the internet, What the audience tells us on the internet is that they want very emotional content. They want stuff that makes them angry or happy or validated. And so you see emotion becoming the driving force on the internet. And often it is much easier to get emotion into a piece when there is some sort of conclusion or indignity or a protagonist. Right. Yeah. So when you give the story a purpose or a mission or a point of view where there are good guys and bad guys and more for somebody to hang on to as an emotional connection, then people are more likely to say, well, yes, I agree with that, as opposed to now I have to make up my own mind. So that is the medium, you know, Marshall McLuhan says the medium is the message, right? And that is absolutely true when it comes to both national cable news and the internet, is that the medium becomes the message and the medium drives us more toward opinionated information. Now, that doesn't mean that when you go and you look at 
the Washington Post or the New York Times or the St. Louis Post Dispatch or the Cleveland Plain Dealer, that they are doing a greater proportion of opinionated journalism. They're all doing more. They have way more stories that they're putting out there. But probably the work that they're doing, if you were to compare it to, say, 1975, would be very similar in proportion. It's just that now so many more people see it. And the opinionated stuff and the emotional stuff has so much more impact. Yeah, back then, you're right. I mean, that's a really great distinction is that there was this half hour and maybe there were the six o'clock news and the seven o'clock news. And that was sort of it. If you missed it, you had to wait for the morning paper or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But now there is an endless cycle of options for you to pick your news source from. Right. And as a human being, you pick the more emotional stuff. Right. Right. You just do. Whereas if you look at that half hour or that paper that came in the morning or the afternoon, that was a highly curated produced product. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you join the Pointer Institute, but how did it come to be? Like, was there a sentinel event or a reason, raison d'etre? Tell us more about that. Oh yeah. There's a guy, Nelson Pointer. He was a newspaper owner. And in the 1970s, and maybe even in the 60s, probably the most prescient thing that he did was he could see the corporatization of local newspapers. He could see that Knight Ritter and Gannett were going to buy up everybody. And that if you left the paper... And here we are. Yep. If you left the paper to your children and they left them to their children, that eventually there would be so many shareholders that it would be more profitable for them to cash out than to simply maintain ownership of the paper. So he was very concerned about his baby, the St. Petersburg Times, being sold off to a corporation. And he was trying to figure out a structure that would prevent that from happening. So he created a nonprofit training institute for journalism. His secondary concern was that as an unlicensed profession, journalism had no mechanism for doing professional education of its practitioners. And so he was like, I can kill two birds with one stone. I will provide the industry with a way of training itself. And I will also create an ownership structure for my newspaper. And how much of the industry is actually taking advantage of that education that you provide? We train worldwide 50,000 people a year. We train a lot of people and we do it in a bunch of different mechanisms, right? Like we have asynchronous courses that people can just log on and take. We have courses that you can fly here and take. We put on conferences. We are the home of the International Fact-Checking Network. We are the home of MediaWise, which is a media literacy division that trains news consumers. We can count in all different sorts of ways. But if you just look at like the professional journalists that take a course from us in a given year, it's 40, 50,000 people in a year. So it's a lot. It is a lot. There's one one thought I had that it keeps coming up for me is that there's a distinction between a media or a news organization and the people who are out there on the front lines doing the work for that organization. So you've been talking a lot about the journalists. Mm -hmm. Is there a disconnect between the journalists having a sense of responsibility and a curiosity about their ethics and what the media organizations are willing to put their shoulder behind? I don't think as much as it used to be, right? We work a lot directly with media organizations. We write policies for them. We'll do training in a news organization around ethical standards. We're currently leading dozens and dozens of news organizations through a transformation process to rethink how they cover crime. So news organizations have become much more professionalized in their policies and practices and procedures. I think we're trending in the right direction in this conversation because Jen and I have been investigating this violent crime that happened to our friends. We would really like to get into this conversation about responsibility for journalists and media companies around how crime is covered. And I know that you're on the, the leading edge of that right now. Can you share with us what's happening in that world and what you see evolving and what you're feeling good about? There has always been a sort of unholy marriage between sensational crimes and journalism. 
And you saw that really explode in the late 1960s and early 1970s as local television news became more and more of a thing. And there was an invention and you can Google it. There's a very good documentary that was done by the Philadelphia Inquirer on the invention of eyewitness news because it was invented in Philadelphia. And it was invented to scare the crap out of white people in the suburbs with stories about crime in the cities, right? And they literally say that in the documentary. Um, And the guy who invented this form of journalism, Al Primo, but it had this cascading effect. So you have this moment where television news starts covering crime in a fairly sensational way, mainly to scare people and to compel them and get them addicted to this form of storytelling. Newspapers quickly jump in and become part of that. And I was very much as a reporter in the 1990s, very much part of that problem, right? Like I wanted to cover crime, not because I wanted the public to have information to keep themselves safer, but because I was more interested in the narratives and the characters and the drama The intrigue, yeah. Right. The human drama that comes with it. Like Truman Capote, right? I think one of the perfect examples of somebody that as a crime reporter, you thought, oh, right. Like you wanted to know because you thought that you could reveal something about human nature in these very dark episodes. But I could also see where that desire, like you said, that that drive of being acknowledged by your peers, that that was part of it too. It's like, you want to make a good story. A hundred percent. Yeah. Right. And you got rewarded for doing very dramatic stories, right? There were awards, local and national awards. So that happens. And then in the 90s, you have the invention of the term super predator, which has been wholly debunked, right? And the New York Times has done a documentary on that. And So if you Google New York Times super predator documentary, they have a good like 11, 12 minute documentary on on how bad that was. So that was, you know, the Bloods and the Crips are expanding and crack cocaine is supposedly taking over the country. Police forces are developing these gang units. And then this super predator term comes along. And as journalists, we are just eating that crap up. The Bloods and the Crips are coming to your town and they're all going to sell drugs to your kids. And and as a result of that, there is a direct line between that line of reporting and 48 states changing their criminal codes around juvenile prosecutions in particular, right? Juveniles can be prosecuted as adults. They are given harsher sentences. The rehabilitative part of juvenile justice is thinned out and a more punitive part comes in. And so it becomes a problem and journalism becomes part of the problem. If you or someone you know is connected either personally or as the result of violent crime to Alfredo Prieto, a convicted rapist and killer who lived in and around San Bernardino, California, Arlington, Virginia, and Jamaica, Queens, New York, between the years of 1984 and 1990, we'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at the heromakerpodcast.com. One of my big questions for you was about what can you point to? Where are the metrics that show us that journalism actually impacts violent crime or public health? Public health, right. Yeah. And you just nailed a huge one. And that is so, so sad. We changed the entire criminal code based on journalism. Well, that is like hugely shocking. Anyway, keep going. Well, you can see through both Gallup and Pew, you can see polling that shows that generally people believe crime is going up always. They always believe crime is going up. And you can see that crime went down for 20 years, right? From like 1990, maybe 30 years to 2020, it declined. And why do they think crime is going up? Well, the portion of local and national news that cover crime has stayed the same or gone up. When it comes to local news, they tend to devote the same amount of their resources to covering crime, whether crime is going up or down, right? It's regardless of the trends, you will see the same number of crime stories. So they're, they're, over time, 
creating a false narrative. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But now it is going up. Not overall. It's going back down. It depends on which type of crime you're talking about. First of all, it went up in 2020 and then it leveled out in 2021. And the indications are that it's coming back down in 2022. It's not going up nearly to the levels that it was in the early 1990s. That's right. Not even close, right? You're seeing small blips. And even in places like Chicago and Philadelphia, where it is the highest, it's going down. And also the way that we count crime is usually by raw numbers as opposed by rates, right? So per 100,000 population would be the more accurate way to count it. And when you do it that way, it actually declines in a pretty steady way. And even when you see these rises in Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, when you look at it per 100,000, the rises are much less dramatic. Can you talk a little bit about like what the curriculum is designed to do in this class that you offer, where you ask for three members of a news media team to come together to be more uh, knowledgeable about how their reporting on crime intersects with public health? Yeah. So what I encourage them to do is to first identify a mission for why you cover crime at all. And that's why I ask for it to be a cross-sectional representation of the newsroom. And it takes them two weeks or so to even come to a consensus with the team that has been nominated by the newsroom around what the mission is. But for the most part, they say something like, We want to inform our audience so that they can make better decisions and participate in democracy. They identify a public safety mission. Then we teach them how to audit their own content. And we say, you know, so do an audit and analyze what portion of the stories that you're doing that have anything to do with crime could in any way help people stay safe. And that is a come to Jesus moment for many of them. Oh, I would imagine. I would totally imagine. Because they're like, oh, right. Like just telling people that there were 12 shootings over the weekend does nothing to help them keep safe, right? And then we show them how harmful their work actually is and how the people who are most affected by crime are actually harmed by this kind of reporting because it feeds into the public bias around who criminals are. There's this really interesting study that we use all the time, and it looks at arrest data, and you can do it locally or you can do it nationally. And so we know that Black people are over-policed, right? That they represent about 22 to 24% of all arrests, even though they're only 12 to 14% of the population. There's lots of ways to explain that, right? And we're not really concerned about that part of it, right? Because that's the policing system. But then when you look at the news stories about arrests, Black people represent about 37% of all the news stories where somebody is arrested. So it furthers the false narrative. There may be, probably is, bias in policing. And then that bias is amplified by journalism, in the stories that we choose to report. Now, why does that happen? Lots of different reasons, but it's problematic that it exists. But additionally, so white people represent anywhere between like 68 to 70% of all the people who are arrested in any given year in the United States. They are only represented like 30% of the time in news stories about people who are arrested. So we overstate Black criminality and we grossly understate white criminality. And that just has to do with the FBI felony crimes, right? That they count. You know, we don't even cover other sorts of crime like wage theft or environmental crimes or stuff like that, right? Which further changes the narrative about public safety. So we sort of show them all of this. We meet every two weeks We ask them to take one more step, identify a mission, analyze your content, analyze your relationship with law enforcement, look at how many times you are representing communities in your stories and the people who are most affected by crime, do a source analysis, make a promise, make a policy about the types of stories that you're going to cover, 
look at how often you cover a story that says somebody's been arrested, but then never follow up on it, which is really common in most forms of journalism and really harmful. Look at some special problems like covering sexual assault, covering juvenile crime, covering mass shootings, covering suicide. Write a policy that will correct for all of this and then create training and implement the training. And it takes a long time because you get like the three or five or six people on the team, you get them bought in and you get maybe 80% of the newsroom bought in. But you have these holdouts and the holdouts tend to be in a couple of places. One is the people who are responsible for juicing the traffic on the website are never in favor of this because they know that those cheap crime stories drive not a significant amount of traffic, but if you can do a whole bunch of them, they'll keep your traffic up. But the other people who fight this are the people who are very good at the old way of doing crime reporting. And they fight it because they have been told over and over again that this is what they should be doing and that they're good at it. Well, they've been rewarded. Exactly. Yeah. So what? So then we try and create a new system for rewarding the new form of journalism, right? So we get the policy, but then we start to really work on the culture because if you want to change the culture in newsrooms, you have to reward the behavior that you want to reward. Reward what you want to see more of. Yeah. It's true in any line of work. Mm -hmm. Interesting that you talk about the search engine optimization folks having, it's almost like the little guy behind the curtain who's pulling the levers about what the public is going to see because they know what's going to drive the revenue or the click rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting about that to me is that that person is not a vice president necessarily. It's the tech person, tech support. It's someone who's, are you talking about the- They report to a vice president though, right? Well, it seems like it's about protecting their job in a way. Well, it's about, it's about protect every, it's about- Or their revenue, protecting their revenue. It's about protecting a KPI, right? Their job is to keep the traffic on the site up because whether you are an advertising supported site or a subscription supported site, you need a broad, shallow group of people, right? Who either you can keep showing ad impressions to or who are going to go down a funnel and convert. Now, for subscribers, they've realized that a lot of times those cheap crime stories that just say somebody got shot, those don't drive subscriptions. Okay, so great, because that was going to be my next question. Like you give them this whole new way of doing things and you say, we're going to change the culture and this is going to be great for you and it's going to be good for your business. But is it actually good for their business? <laughs> well, the problem is, is subscription businesses are hired on a local level. I don't know that that's completely going to work in journalism. I think that it's going to be a combo of subscription and community support of some other kind. Right. But it's a lot easier now than it was five years ago to make the argument that you don't need that cheap traffic, right? That that's not necessarily good for your business. And it probably hurts your brand. And it actually puts you in some amount of legal jeopardy and injures your relationship with some of the audience that you would like to build a relationship with. Right. You know, I'd love to see this work that you're talking about, the intersection of crime coverage and public health, public sense of well-being. I'd love to see that continue to grow to a space where we get upstream of the crime. Mm -hmm. Like when we're covering the crime, the, the big bad incident, even if it's not a big bad incident, but the when we're covering the crime, when are we going back to look upstream to how that person or the situation unfolded? There's so many things that I'm coming to appreciate about the intersection of public health and policing. Uh, for instance, the CDC is a trove of data, right? Mm -hmm. They have some really fascinating data. And one of those is life expectancy by postal code. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you look even in little old Vermont at some of our very troubled uh, communities that have experienced a surge in violent crime, mostly related to the illicit drug trade, which implicates all kinds of social services and addiction and uh, escapism, like all sorts of stuff in the public health space. If you look at the areas where the violent crime and overdoses are hot, you see a very hot area, even within the same community. And on the other side of town, the 
good side of town in a different postal code, the difference in life expectancy exceeds 10 years. Mm -hmm. Literally, we're talking about a 10 year difference in a Vermont community by depending on what part of town you live in. Right. And those are the kinds of things that I wish newsrooms would dig into and start talking about equity. How do we bring equity to service delivery in policing? And why aren't we looking at outcomes of, you know, that's such a disparate outcome of life expectancy. Mm -hmm. What is the responsible role of journalism in telling the community story if they really, they start from the premise and that you said that they all say, well, we want to inform people. We want to help keep them safe. But I think we all know that that's not true. Nowhere in that is the word equity, right? That might not be any news organization's intention to promote equity. Some of them speak about equity, not all of them. And you're right. It's not going to be universal that they'll speak about equity, but they will talk about documenting. And it's funny because I was actually on a call with the CDC earlier today about training journalists to use their whiskers and wonder database to use it better for a bunch of different things, including gun violence and the impacts of crime. Part of the problem in journalism is doing that story is so much harder, right? It takes more time and you don't pump out the number of articles. And... and it takes more seniority, right? It takes more expertise. And most of the people covering crime are the junior reporters. And it's especially hard. And what I've seen, the trend that I've seen in many organizations is so they'll get their main crime reporters on board. And then the weekend crime reporters go to town on the crappy crime story. Yeah. And it's like, okay, okay, wait, 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 we got to fix that. Or the night reporters. And so it is an institutional habit that you have to break. And the habit is to stop doing those incidental crime coverage stories, because for the most part, they just are not helpful. So you have to elevate the threshold at which you cover those things yes. significantly. And then you got to keep challenging it to get it a little higher and a little higher. And then you have to break the reporters who have pressure on them to produce something, anything today, there's a hole to fill to not go under that threshold. And you have to give them permission to maybe not have anything today, Yeah, which is a really hard thing because it's Saturday and there literally is nothing going on, right? So you don't need to do anything. You need to change the relationship with the police department because a lot of the reasons why those cheap crime stories happen is because the PIO sends out a release and says, hey, this is going on and I will give you access to it. So you need to change the relationship with the police department so that the reporters can get more contextual information so that they can really judge if this clears the threshold or not. It goes back to where we started about how you got your job, which was, it's all about the relationships, right? So you built a relationship, you found you had something in common with a person at the Pointer Institute, and lo and behold, you keep talking, and all of a sudden, now you know you have greater perspective, and now you want to do that job. I mean, that really is the truth, and it's particularly true in a small state like Vermont, that if you have a relationship with an individual reporter or even a an outlet, you know, whether it's print or broadcast, you have trust with them and you are willing to provide some off the record comments that allow the context to be built without betraying anything that can't be in the public space. And without the context, I frequently as a police leader have been frustrated when the media gets it wrong or they take the scant facts we've put out there and they spin it in a direction that is antithetical to actually what's true. But at the end of the day, who is that on? It, we're not giving them. We're like, you know, just we can only give you this much. And we, with many news outlets, don't give them a look behind the curtain so that they can find the context or pull the right thread in that story. So when you only give people breadcrumbs, they're going to make not a very good meatball. But if you give them all the ingredients, they're going to make a really good meatball, right? And so... I do think that it's incumbent on all pieces of this, not just the police and the media, but also our public health officials, our um, education officials. You know, I think we just have to, we're not going in the right direction. Like, I just want to point that out. Our politicians <laughs> too, right? Yeah. There's a group called the Fair and Just Prosecution 
And it's basically the reform minded prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And they talked about how the media messes them up. So like in Chicago, Kim Fox is the prosecutor and a crime will happen. And the police department isn't saying anything about the crime, but the police union will show up and say, this is because Kim Fox's bail reform and the media will run with it because they get nothing else. It's a guy standing in front of a bunch of flashing lights and a yellow tape. And he looks like he knows what he's talking about and nobody else is saying anything. And so then they call Kim Fox and they're like, the police union guy says that this particular shooting of four people in this crime ridden neighborhood is your fault. And she's like, what am I supposed to say to that? The context has already been set and there is nothing I can say that's going to change that, right? I'm just going to come off looking defensive defensive and weak and uninformed and ineffective. She and I went toe to toe because I was like, no, journalists want to get better about covering crime. And she was like, not in Chicago, they don't. They actually do. I suspect there's some truth that that environmentally Mm -hmm. that I suspect it's different in different communities, just as, like I said, even within the small community of Vermont, there are outlets that I would happily grant open access to my office or people within my office. And there are other outlets that I'd be really cautious with and maybe only exchange comment in writing, right? So that I have a paper trail of what was said. So I did a training with a television station in Vermont recently. Did you? Which one was it? What are your main stations? What are their call letters? WCAX. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that that would that does not surprise me that they they've been around a very long time. Yeah, I did it on February eighth. Wow. Um, and it wasn't around this; it was just around general ethics. But they were interested in this. I'm definitely hearing an opportunity. Have you worked with PIOs and public health? folks to help educate on that side, how the police departments can interact better with the media? I have not on this issue. I worked with public health people around sexual assault a lot. And that was sort of how I came up with this model, because we used to have the same problem with sexual assault. We used to only cover stranger attacks, Mm -hmm. which created a false narrative. And people didn't understand that like, oh, no, stranger assaults are a minuscule part of sexual assaults. That is so true. And now people get that a lot more. And I did that work. I started that work in early to mid 2000s. I want to say that by the time Jerry Sandusky was charged, I was at that time, I was the ombudsman for ESPN. And I took them to task for focusing in their first 72 hours of coverage on Penn State's recruiting issues, as opposed to the fact that there were 70 some children that had been sexually abused by a coach. But I was able to do it because people within the ESPN had been exposed to that message, right? That sexual assault is not the stranger on the corner. It's the coach or the teacher or the boyfriend or the dad. And so the way journalism comes to these things is the way society comes to them, right? Which is a little, a little, a little, a lot, and then a little bit more and a little bit more. That's a responsibility. That's an opportunity Mm -hmm. for the media. Like I think the same about domestic violence. We don't talk about it enough. We don't talk enough about it in the public space until there's a domestic violence homicide. And then we talk about it a lot. And then you hear crickets for however long until the next huge case. But domestic violence is driving a lot of chaos in our schools. It's ubiquitous, right? Yes. In our workplaces, absenteeism, loss of focus. Like We're not talking about it. And I, I think we need to talk about things like that more. I wish that law enforcement and public health people worked more closely together because I feel like there's a synergy there that is a missed opportunity. And so you asked if I've worked with PIOs on this and I have not, I would love to, but I think, I mean, you know, it's interesting because I have this sneaking suspicion that the number of PIOs has increased dramatically in policing. I mean, when I was a police reporter in the early 1990s, 
the agencies that I covered did not have round the clock PIOs. They relied on the shift sergeants. Mm -hmm. And now most agencies have round the clock PIOs. And I want to say that that exacerbates this problem because you have PIOs working the second and third shift and they're putting out press releases based on incidents as opposed to thinking about what does the community need to know holistically. And then also that idea of setting the narrative. Right, right. And so then you have these journalists who come in at four o'clock in the morning and need to juice the web traffic for the seven o'clock bump or the eight o'clock bump. And they like are looking at like, what can we do? What do we have? And there's all these press releases out there. We're getting away from that. But that has definitely been a dynamic that I noticed. It was like these two things happened, right? All the police agencies developed around the clock PIOs that were staffing their social media and sort of looking for ways to get information out about the police department. But you could even bring in that third piece that we're dancing around right now, the triangle of also bringing in the public health piece. And they could be Mm -hmm. part of this conversation too. Well, if they were, that would disrupt this and that would be good, right? Because if PIOs weren't sending out so many press releases on incidents and instead were looking to get more trend data, like it's so rare for a police department, some of the big ones do it, but it's so rare for a police department to say, you know, we have noticed in the last three months, this rising trend of X and to give all the data, whether it's drug overdoses or domestic violence or any of that, like they don't get into that very much. And I don't know why. I don't know why police agencies don't do that. More real-time data releases. The Williamson County Cultural Arts Commission of Franklin, Tennessee, wishes to thank our men and women in blue who help us deliver safe and fun family and community cultural events year-round, including one of the only authentic bluegrass festivals in the country. Bluegrass Along the Harvest takes place every July and at the Williamson County Fair in August and at the annual Tennessee International Independent Film Festival. Check out our full calendar of events at wccac-tn.org. I have a question I have been waiting to ask. Okay. In the course of my career, there have been several cases, I guess, where I have scratched my head and said, how the heck did someone at that outlet decide that that's the content they were going to release or the photo or whatever? So like when covering a difficult story, like our friend's case Mm -hmm. or a school shooting or another event that you know is going to be impactful to the community, how should these media outlets balance what they tell, what they show, et cetera? Well, I mean, how should they do it and how do they do it? I can talk about both. Lay it on me. There is a definite difference in many places, not always. What you should be doing is documenting what happened in a way that the community can make sense, hold people accountable when somebody needs to be held accountable, and understand what could have been done to prevent, right? Like that's what they should be doing. What they do do is compete with each other to get baby scoops. Mm -hmm. So a big scoop is I got the story first, but a baby scoop is I got to this witness or I got this photo or I found this trail on social media or I found this public document or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Little scoops. And there's all these metaphors in journalism for when you're throwing everything at a story, right? You're throwing every resource that you have and people are looking for anything. And that idea of what is the broader narrative and how do these small pieces fit in? Journalism often abdicates any responsibility for answering that question in the heat of the moment. Because what many journalists would say is, I don't know. I don't know whether this photo or whether this detail is important. 
it could become very important. And I talk to people now who are a little more circumspect. So for instance, I think a classic case was when the Austin American statesman got the video recording of the cops in the hallway in Uvalde. So everybody who was reporting that story knew that that video existed and people had heard it described and the police response had already been widely condemned, right? So there is an accountability narrative that is already in play and has mostly been documented with words, but not videos and timelines. First cop arrives on the scene Here's the 911. There's been a lot of documentation, but when that video comes out, there is suddenly a level of documentation that was not available. And the Austin American Statesman spent a lot of time trying to figure out. They did not publish that right away. They waited a good 72 hours. They had already pre made a bunch of decisions, right? Because they knew that they were going to get the video somehow. They were pressing to get someone to leak it to them. And when it finally got leaked to them, they spent 72 hours trying to figure out what to do with it and how to do it. And at first they were just going to edit it down to this four minute thing. And then they realized that people were going to judge them for the choices that they were making in editing. So they wanted to also release the whole thing. And then as they were listening to it, they realized that like hearing the horrible sounds of children screaming and dying, that you couldn't do that to the families. And so they took all that out. They took all the sound out. You know, I think about that. I watch that video a lot and help them make those decisions. Then I think about the Nashville shooting and the police who released their video right away and how on it they were in that mass shooting, the Nashville police. I think one of the purposes that that video served was as an educational tool for police agencies everywhere. The Uvalde one? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. About like what not to do. When we heard that, we were like, that that has not been the way people have been trained in 15 years Mm -hmm. to set a perimeter and wait. That went out the window 15 years ago. So I don't know. I, that that whole thing was so shocking. The way Nashville did it, we've been training for well over a decade. But how often do police respond to a scene and not do what they were trained to do, right? Like that's not unheard of. It, it's inconceivable to me in this day and era that you could respond to an active shooter situation and not go in immediately. I agree. And it happened, right? And I bet you it will never happen again. Don't say never because they're humans. So, I mean, the problem was a command problem, right? Like nobody felt like they had the authority to make the decision. And in Nashville, you saw this guy, the guy who pulled the rifle out and went in first and got the three guys behind him, right? And he was like, he knew he had the authority. Right. Everyone has the authority. There's no rank in an active shooter. Because you're a cop. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's right. It doesn't matter if the first one there is the chief of police or the newest rookie. Yeah. You go in the door and you go towards the sound of gunfire. Yeah. There's, I mean, it's, uh, anyway, we, we're down a rabbit hole. But when you think about your career, it, actually, as a practitioner, I mean, I know you're still a practitioner, but you're sort of in the teacher mentor role now. You're sort of doing some shaping in the industry. Knowing everything you know now, what would you tell an up-and-coming young reporter, maybe your young self 30 years ago? Oh, man. I would tell my young self 30 years ago, don't look at the individual incidents of crime, even the big sensational ones that you just want to dig in and do a novel about. Instead, look at all the ways that crime impacts everybody. Talk to public health people a lot more. Talk to insurance people a lot more. Look at the systems and don't keep waiting for that big incident to come up, right? I built my career on horrible incidents and like digging into them. And I was really good at it. And I would say the same thing to a young journalist. Those are easy stories to tell. Do the hard thing. Do the hard thing. Yeah. That's a, that's a good piece of advice for anyone. Yeah. Can you share with us a few examples or maybe one great example of who is doing it well right now? Where are we seeing great ethical journalism 
from maybe you can give an example of a journalist and maybe you can give an example of a company that's following their values and their code. KPBS in San Diego is a public radio station. Now, it's easy to say, well, public radio, that's it. But public radio's approach to crime has been just to ignore it. They mostly don't cover crime at all. And they've sort of said, well, we'll let the commercial media do that because there's not a space for us. But they have figured out that in San Diego, there are a lot of public health issues that are really important. And so they have recently come up with, first of all, a list of when they actually should cover incidents. It's everything from when public health is threatened to wildfires, right? They've come up with a model. And then they've also said that they have an obligation to cover the communities who are most impacted by crime and to get upstream. So they have a mission. And when you look at their reporting around unhoused people mm-hmm. or their education reporting, they are doing a really good job. So that's one. And then in Phoenix, Arizona, there is a television station, ABC 15, and they are doing very good accountability journalism around law enforcement. And there are some significant problems throughout Arizona law enforcement with their professional demeanor. They have done many investigations on trends in law enforcement that are antithetical to democratic societies and that undermine the justice system. And they have sacrificed their ability to tell stories of individual incidents of crime because law enforcement won't work with them anymore, right? They ace them out and they have said, well, we're okay with that because we believe that holding law enforcement accountable is more important than doing individual stories of shootings or dramatic criminal incidents. So those are two examples. You know, I want to say that the Minneapolis Star Tribune had been going down this path for a while. And when George Floyd happened, one of the things that they did, you know, there's this habit in journalism to amplify the initial report of police in an incident of use of force. And the first use of force when it came to George Floyd was a lie. The first report out from the police, they basically said that George Floyd died in custody of a medical incident. And many journalists reported that. But the Minneapolis Star Tribune had already been, you know, the the police department in Minneapolis was having a lot of problems with over-policed communities. And the Minneapolis Star Tribune was aware that this was a neighborhood where that was likely to happen. And they did not repeat that. And instead, they went looking for video evidence, and they were the first to surface the video evidence. And they were like, oh, we found the medical incident. So I think there are a lot of places that have gotten a leg up on this. That's amazing. I think there's still a long way to go. And yeah, I would welcome at some point uh, furthering the conversation about how we work with the media, not at arm's length of the media and our partners in public health. I would love to be part of that conversation too. We're doing the public health and public safety work right now in Vermont. I'm working particularly around violent crime and a subsection of that that we're really focusing on is domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with the commissioner of health, who is a little bit of a rock star around Vermont after our really fantastic COVID response. And he was the public face along with the governor of it. So Dr. Mark Levine and I are working very closely with our partners who oversee all of the domestic violence and sexual assault, you know, the local programs to really try to take this moment in time while we're talking about violent crime to not just gloss over the fact that domestic violence is 50% or more of that violent crime bucket. That's really cool. Yeah. If you're missing the biggest piece of the violent crime. It's a far larger swath than the shootings, the stabbings, et cetera, the kidnappings. But anyway, we're starting to really lean into that work. And maybe as we get a little more mature in our work, we could seek you out to talk some more about how we could leverage a partnership with a media outlet to shape the way the community regards domestic violence. Because I think we need to do some Mm -hmm. stigma reduction. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's so much 
I mean, as somebody who came from a violent relationship, right, there's so much that people don't understand about domestic violence. So, yes. yeah, I would very much love to be a part of that. I do see the possibility of us intersecting with you again, because what you're talking about, like the way you cover crime matters, and here's how it impacts your community. Like we need that whole triangle. We need public health, policing, and the storytelling that takes the community in the right direction because we are going in the wrong direction. It's hard because there are a lot of people in all of these communities. I used to think that, oh, public health people, they would never mislead the public. And now I'm in Florida, right? And our Surgeon General has deliberately misled the public, right? And so in all of these factions, there are badly intentioned people. Mm-hmm. And that creates a trust problem for everybody else, yep. right? Yep. So like when I talk to journalists about, hey, you need to build a better relationship with law enforcement or public health. The first thing that they're going to ask is, is this a well-intentioned law enforcement or public health person who's actually interested in the truth? Or is this a politically motivated person who's interested in advancing a narrative? Because like, think about trying to do this in Florida. Mm-hmm. It's It would not be possible, right? Yeah. Hot mess. The politics here are so toxic right now that the journalists are just trying to stay on top of what the truth is and trying to get people the truth. And they're not being helped by their public health officials or by law enforcement a lot of times. In fact, they are oftentimes at cross purposes. Agreed. We have sheriffs here who are running on I mean, and have been for a long time on expanding stand your ground. And we now have permitless concealed carry here in Florida. We've always had that in Vermont, by the way. Have you really? Oh, yeah. You can carry concealed or otherwise. Mm -hmm. No permit required. The only restrictions are if you're federally disqualified as a convicted felon or a person subject to a restraining order or, you know, the other very finite federal restrictions. But No state law at all about carrying concealed, loaded, or otherwise. There are regulations about how you transport a gun in a motor vehicle, yeah, but not about how you carry it in public, in the grocery store. So you could go into a school. Well, there are regulations about schools, and I believe there's healthcare restrictions on firearms. What about a theme park? Well, we don't have any of those in Vermont. You could walk down the Church Street Marketplace in Burlington with a rifle slung and there's nothing anyone can do. You can walk through the grocery store aisles or the department store with a pistol on your hip. Yeah. No rules. Wow. And you guys haven't had a ton of mass shootings. No, not many. Have you had any school shootings? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Not, not, I mean knock every piece of wood nearby. Yeah. 20 years now, 20 years now since Essex wow. high school. I mean, like the idea of somebody walking into Disney with a gun. would well, be really uncomfortable on the roller coasters. I just want to say that. I don't know that they'd want it on the roller coaster, right? Like right. you never know what can happen on a roller coaster. <laughs> you got to be true. prepared. All right, Uh-oh. ladies, you're yeah. amazing. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this deep discussion, this wide discussion. Thank you for the good work you're doing in the world, both of you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Andrea. And Kelly, I really do hope that our paths cross. I have thoughts. I got to percolate on them. Well, you know how to find me. So. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I do. Take care. All right. 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 Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to sound mixer and podcast producer, Michael Doherty, sound designer, Andy Bill of Submachine Audio, and graphic designer, Junglin Bay. Thanks also to me, hearer maker, director, and producer, Andrea Schrieman. Please subscribe to the show where you listen to podcasts and take a moment to rate us. It really helps the podcast grow. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Hero Maker Pod. Want to collaborate or suggest a guest? Please email us at media at theheromakerpodcast.com. The Hero Maker Podcast is a production of Prudent Pictures. Thank you so much for listening.